Good day. I'm Max Hegwam, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on microbial life strategies. We continue our webinar series, which enables us to highlight different topics of microbial ecology to a broad audience. Those of you who have tuned into our previous webinars knows that FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, invests in science, using the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community, such as providing grants to scientists, organize and support conferences and summer schools, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar. And this provides a forum for presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to a worldwide audience. So by publishing in and reading FEMS journals, you support these activities. If you missed earlier webinars, they are available on the FEMS OUP websites. Indeed, I wish to thank the staff of FEMS and Oxford University Press for all their work behind the scenes in making these webinars happen. So today we focus on microbial life strategies. Microbial communities vary greatly as microbes adopt to different niches. Functional and physiological traits are underlying drivers of this niche differentiation. A common framework is based on copiotrophy versus oligotrophy, where resource investment is primarily in either rapid growth or stress tolerance, respectively. Predatory protists are also major consumers of soil microorganisms and the feeding patterns by these predators have an important role to play in shaping soil microbiota. It is also recognized that microbial communities can have dramatically different compositions, even among similar environments. And this multi-stability in multi-species communities combined with ecological noise may lead to unpredictable community assembly, even in very simple environments. Indeed, there's much to learn about the factors that shape the composition and activities of microbial communities. Our three speakers today will dive into these complex topics of microbial life strategies. First, uh, Damien Finn from the Thunen Institute of Biodiversität in Germany will discuss functional trait relationships. Then uh, Nathalie Amaker, uh, now at the Swiss Quality Testing Services, will uh, examine protist feeding patterns. And then finally, Eric Wright from the University of Pittsburgh will discuss multi-stable bacterial communities. After the talk, we will open uh, the session for questions and discussions. So please submit your questions via the chat link or, or the Q&A link, and we will get back to these then at the end of the session. So with that, welcome everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, Damien, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Max. Uh, okay. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. I have a little message saying that that's uh, so. Uh, today, I would like to discuss uh, oxytrophy as a life strategy with you. Uh, I don't know if I'm using the, uh, the term life strategy a little bit too liberally here, but uh, we'll see how we go. I'll let you be the judge of that. So when we often think about evolution, uh, at least me personally, uh, I tend to think about like, you know, uh, the uh, new function coming along or at least the adaptation of a pre-existing function to a new set of conditions. But that's not the whole story. And uh, gene loss is a pretty powerful driver of evolution as well. And generally, if there's no selection pressure on a gene or a function that uh, it provides, then mutations can accrue over time with the final result being the loss of that function. And so we know from the long term uh, evolution experiment that if you accept, uh, successively grow E. coli uh, in a medium where glucose is the sole carbon source, then over time, those E. coli strains will lose the capacity to uh, catabolize other carbon substrates because they haven't encountered it before. They don't need it. It's just it's not important anymore. Also, if we go out into the, the actual world, into the wide blue ocean uh, here, we find that uh, some of the most abundant marine taxa uh, floating about in the 
the surface layer of the ocean also are riddled with gene loss. Uh, a really good example of that is um, the loss of catalase in uh, prochlorococcus. So the tricky thing is when uh, gene loss sort of uh, means that you've lost some kind of uh, protein or growth factor that you require uh, to live. And uh, what we do know is that, um, yes, absolutely, uh, the ability to synthesize growth factors is susceptible to gene loss. We call prototrophs uh, organisms that are able to synthesize all of the growth factors that they require. Uh, and then conversely, oxytrophs are those organisms that cannot synthesize all of their growth factors. And just like in our E. coli that um, only grows with glucose over time, if we grow E. coli successively in media where uh, all the growth factors they require are provided to them, then they will develop oxytrophy. Again, if you walk out into the, the wild blue yonder out into the world, and we see that oxytrophy is common across prokaryotes, eukaryotes. So you are an oxytroph. If you uh, decide to take a long sea voyage from Europe to Australia without packing any vitamin C, you will get scurvy. Uh, incidentally, this is by far the least nauseating picture of scurvy I could find through Google. I would not recommend it uh, based on those pictures. Uh, but also in prokaryotes, with some nice work done very recently, we see that in uh, environmental culture collections, upwards of 50% of those strains are oxytrophs as well. So uh, this loss of uh, growth factor synthesis is uh, it's out there. It's a thing. Yeah, so the problem here really arises that once you're, uh, as a taxon, you're locked into being an oxytroph, you really need to think about how you're going to get the growth factors that you require. Otherwise, you will die. So a popular choice uh, for a lot of oxytrophs seems to be to become a parasite or a pathogen. Uh, and so by that way, you can forcibly take the growth factors that you require from a eukaryotic host. Alternatively, you can be like the, the friendly arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, and you can become a beneficial symbiont and whereby you can do a nice job for a plant by picking up phosphorus from the environment, for example, while the plant will sort of give you uh, sugar in return. Both of these examples are uh, microbes with a eukaryotic host though. And what we know as microbial ecologists is that the vast majority of biodiversity, men, most of the taxa that actually exist are all free living out in the oceans and the soils, et cetera, et cetera. So the question really arises in these complex communities of free living organisms, who are the oxytrophs and how are they getting their vitamin C? Uh, through a various collection of my own poor life choices, I work in the soil environment, which is uh, a little bit tricky compared to some others. And uh, so all of the work that I show you today, there are some things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the first of which is that soil is a very heterogeneous environment and there's a, um, an issue of spatial scale there. So there's separation of not only microbial taxa uh, from each other, but there's also separation in terms of the resources that they require, whether that be water or organic matter. And so you may have read or heard the sort of the very lovely phrase that like, you know, a gram of soil is a universe, there's almost a billion cells there. That's very true. However, the vast majority of those taxa will never see each other. They will never interact. And so in the soil environment, already we're starting to see that it could be a very, very risky sort of strategy to be an oxytroph. Uh, furthermore, all the work that I talk about today, uh, we work on the, ag uh, the scale of a soil aggregate, which are these tiny little sort of like three milligram amounts of soil, about two millimeters in diameter. Uh, and whilst that spatial scale is still a lot bigger than uh, what is realistic in terms of microbial interactions, it's as best as we can do and it's better than working with 250 milligrams, at least for our questions here today. Another thing to keep in mind is that there are different uh, microhabitats that exist in soil. So there's the bulk soil, which is a relative desert in terms of the amount of uh, carbon input material that comes into the system. And then you also have the rhizosphere, which would be much nicer for microbes because on the, the surface or immediately around the, the plant roots, 
they're, uh, they're receiving a cocktail of nice carbon substrates and also growth factors all the time. And so here already we can see that oxytrophs would preferentially want to be in such an environment rather than the bulk soil. So for the work I show you today, we asked uh, these three specific hypotheses. So firstly, uh, we hypothesized that there would be more oxytrophs present in the rhizosphere than the bulk soil. Uh, secondly, that the complexity of an amino acid will be linked to the gene loss. So if you require more genes to be able to produce a certain amino acid, then just from probability, you're more likely to uh, have some sort of mutations in there and the loss of it over time. And then finally, we predicted that for those oxytrophs that do exist, they have to make some friends, otherwise they, they couldn't exist there in the first place. Uh, so we took a lovely loam soil from Hildesheim in Deutschland here, and uh, some ZMA seeds from the inbred line B73. And then with a very simple pot experiment, uh, we had a bulk soil control with no plant. We had some maize plants growing happily. Uh, all, everything was kept at a, the same moisture, 20% for about two months. And then the maize was harvested at what is called BBCH growth stage 19, which uh, is just after the establishment phase of the, the root rhizosphere of the maize and just before uh, the maize hits its uh, exponential growth stage. We took individual soil aggregates, either from the bulk soil or from the surface of uh, the maize primary or lateral roots. And uh, these aggregates were incubated on a nice cellulose agar medium for up to six days. And so it's really great, this system that we have here, uh, because the aggregates are um, exposed to these, uh, this agar, we can manipulate the communities there in sort of interesting, fun ways. And the way that we went about that for this study was to either provide those aggregates with um, the nice L form of uh, certain amino acids that increase in complexity, lysine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan, or the toxic anti-metabolites, uh, which are structural analogs of those amino acids. So if you're unfamiliar with what an anti-metabolite is, uh, historically, they've been used as a way to um, actively kill oxytrophs and uh, select them out of um, populations. And basically the microbe thinks that the anti-metabolite of lysine is the same as lysine. It tries to incorporate that into protein synthesis, but the protein doesn't work, the cell dies. The, uh, the treatments that we used here uh, was a negative control where no amino acids were provided, a positive control where we gave the good uh, forms of the L-amino acids to, of lysine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan to everyone. And then we have three different anti-metabolite treatments where one of the um, anti-metabolites was substituted. Uh, and then afterwards, we did a very typical microbial ecology workflow, DNA extraction, PCR and qPCR of the 16S RNA gene, amplicon sequencing of that processing um, with Chime2. Uh, but we also did shotgun metagenomics of the enriched communities and uh, did that on the NovaSeq platform. And then those metagenomes were run through uh, MetaRap. Okay, some results. So you'll be quite surprised to hear that uh, when we provide amino acids to microbial communities, we stimulate growth. And uh, in this sort of yellow curve up here in these plots, one from the bulk soil, from one from one of the um, maize plants, uh, that was the positive control where all the amino acids were provided. And of course, this makes perfect sense. These extra amino acids, they can either be an extra carbon source directly for the microbe, or they can be um, funneled straight into uh, protein synthesis. Uh, where things became interesting were the differences between the different anti-metabolites. So what we saw was that the anti-lysine uh, response was uh, very, very slight. There wasn't uh, much of a loss of the population growth relative to the um, positive control there. However, when the communities were forced to synthesize the more complex phenylalanine or tryptophan, uh, their growth or um, even the stability of their presence over time was sort of kept uh, much more similar to the negative control. And remember, in the negative control, these communities actually need to synthesize everything. So not just these particular amino acids, but vitamins and so on and so forth. Uh, and then the other major interesting sort of difference here was that with the, all of our rhizosphere communities, we found that they were very poor 
uh, producers of tryptophan, and indeed they were dying out over time. So it looked like these uh, communities that had adapted to the rhizosphere were uh, not able really to sustain their tryptophan needs. Looking at the functional capacity of these microbes, uh, so this is just a heat map and um, it's presence absence based. And uh, the vast majority of taxa that we could identify, they all encoded for the capacity to um, uh, synthesize their own lysine. And this suddenly made the qPCR data make a lot of sense. So it really uh, is not surprising that the anti-lysine had such a little effect on killing the microbes. And that's because they pretty much all make lysine. Uh, however, it got more interesting with the phenylalanine and tryptophan. Uh, and what we found was that the capacity for this synthesis was far more patchy. So here we have phenylalanine in blue, and then we have tryptophan down here in orange. So this is where we were picking up the, um, the gene loss uh, in these taxa. And so really it should be um, the phenylalanine and tryptophan where we're starting to see these um, ecological interactions between oxytrophs and providers. In order to predict these interactions, we turned to our network theory. And uh, what's something that's really fantastic about this particular study uh, is that we can build temporal networks here, which in my opinion makes them a lot more robust. And the basic idea of that is that with every single taxon, we know how it grows over time. So uh, down here, we have, say, for example, the growth of taxon one and taxon two, and we can see how similar that is. When we start to build our spearman covariance matrix of the, um, the, this growth of these different taxa over time, what we're really looking at is how similar are these organisms uh, matching each other. And then, of course, what we do uh, with networks, we uh, take either the very strong uh, positive uh, connections or the very sort of um, strong negative connections. And then we build some hideous thing that looks like this, where every uh, node is a individual taxon. Every red line is uh, the weighted measure of how uh, negative their covariance is over time. So they did not sort of grow together. They went away from each other. And then in green, we have a positive group. In, these are what our networks um, kind of look like as a trend. Uh, when excess resources or the anti-lysine were provided to communities, we were always getting these very sort of simple, uh, very few nodes. They were all organisms like Pseudomonas and Bacillus, so these sort of like stereotypical competitive copiotrophs, and uh, they just formed these little sort of clustered blobs. However, when we uh, forced our communities to synthesize more complicated amino acids or all of the amino acids, we were getting far more interesting complex networks like here. And uh, basically with all of these, uh, we we're getting more taxa, but also all of these nice sort of sparse interconnections between them as well. Looking at these, it's an absolute mess. It's very difficult to make any sense of this whatsoever. And so what I did from that point was to ask the computer very nicely to run through the uh, pairwise connection of every single taxon uh, in all of these complicated networks to try to identify who are the organisms that are always making friends with each other? Who are the consistently recurring partners? And then from that, we were able to build these much more tractable networks that made a lot more sense. Uh, so in terms of the consistently recurring partners, what we found was that here, at least in this sub-network in the middle, this larger one, in the central points, we were getting uh, two individuals, Methyloceanobacter and an uncultured Actinomycetia. And uh, from our functional information, we could say that these two organisms were fully capable of making lysine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. So that was quite interesting. However, all of the organisms attached to them, well, not all of them, but these four, <laughs> at least, uh, attached to them in the periphery, from our metagenomics work, we could say that these were all putative oxytropes. They were unable to make either phenylalanine or tryptophan, and they were all connected to our um, two providers. So this was quite an interesting outcome because it really sort of gave uh, us some sort of confidence that yes, we can indeed uh, see who are the potential um, providers and also the oxytropes in terms of these um, uh, growth, feeding, uh, growth factor cross-feeding interactions. 
it's not perfect. Uh, there are some individuals here where either the taxonomy, uh, taxonomic resolution or the functional resolution wasn't perfect. So I can't tell you why Vichiname bacteralis was connected to our chemomycetia, but still picking up these particular genera sort of really gave us confidence that we're on the right track for these analyses. Uh, so I'm afraid that I've probably gone over time, but just very quickly, uh, in conclusion, uh, we found that amino acid complexity is absolutely linked to the frequency of gene loss. A taxon in the a free living taxon in the environment is more likely to be an oxytrope for tryptophan than it is for lysine. Uh, we found that there are more tryptophan oxytropes in the rhizosphere than the bulk soil. And so if you have um, become an oxytrope for tryptophan, your chances of survival are much better if you start to make friends with the plant. Uh, rather than sort of risking living in the bulk soil. We identified some potential keystone providers that probably play quite important roles in these communities for oxytrophs, and they were methyl, methyl oceanobacter and then this uncultured actinomycetia that kept popping up. And uh, just in general, uh, we could conclude that the need for cross-feeding interactions is likely quite prevalent in these free living communities. And uh, having a high biodiversity that we often see in uh, microbial ecology is probably good insurance for oxytrophs uh, that are forced to live uh, away from a, a potential eukaryote host. Because the more individuals that are out there, the better your chances of finding at least someone who can make the vitamin C that you need to not get your scurvy. Uh, so to acknowledge, I would like to thank uh, Christoph Tebby and also um, Mia, Christina and Graham uh, one from Tunen, others from Ecole Centrale de Lyon, all of whom are forever sort of supporting me and all the crazy ideas that I come up with. I would like to thank uh, Max and Ben's Microbial Ecology uh, for inviting me, and then the DFA for uh, monies and things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Damien. Very, very interesting. I already have a whole bunch of questions also to follow up on. And again, for everybody else, uh, we'll leave those to the Q&A session at the end. So, so again, please uh, type in your question to the uh, read a Q&A link and we will get back to these then at the end. So no, thank you. And we move on to Nathalie Amaker, who's going to provide a different aspect on, on microbial life systems and what's driving communities from the bottom up now to the top down, looking at protest feeding patterns and how they impact soil bacterial communities. So Natalie, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Max. It was a very nice presentation. So I hope I keep it up uh, to this level. <laughs> Let me try to share my screen. I think that should be good, right? Can you uh, see yes. it? Cool. That's perfect. It's always the bit of the stressful moment. <laughs> So yeah, great to be here and to be able to present. Thank you very much for um, the invitation and the introduction. So I want to discuss today uh, predatory protists and most of the work I'm presenting today is related to the paper we published a bit earlier this year. And I always like to first start with what protists are because you may not all be very familiar with them. So protists are eukaryotes and they are eukaryotes that are not plants, not animals and not fungi. That's probably one of the most terrible definition uh, in biology because it's like it's all what they are not. So I'm also always trying to give what they are. So they have their eukaryotes and like you know, eukaryotes, they have a nucleus and membrane bound organelles. This is different from a prokaryote like the bacteria. And you can also uh, see here, I will get the laser pointer so I can show you here. And here you can see so that they come uh, in various sizes. So from a few micrometers up to millimeters, they have a great variety of forms and morphologies. So you can have amoebas, flagellates, or some other very nice amoeba that also have a shell. So they protect themselves with a shell. And so many more. So I won't uh, discuss all of them, but just for you to appreciate a bit their diversity. And here, so you just have a small amoeba moving around just for you to see so how they are when they are moving. Um, with all this variety, they so of course have a lot of different ecological roles. So we can find some primary producers in the group of the protists, decomposers, parasites, and predators. 
And in the soils, it, it has been shown that most of the, the most abundant functional group of birdies are actually uh, predators. And here I just have two graphs uh, showing that from, from some recent papers. They both were looking at the distribution of functional groups of produce. And they both found that in the soil, the most abundant group was the one of the predators or consumer, how they uh, term it here. And of course, it's always interesting to know uh, who are the most abundant one, but we also want to understand uh, why is it important and what they are doing in, uh, in the system. And especially in my, in my research, we were looking at how this may be uh, related to plant growth and how um, the produce may be, predatory produce may be important for plant growth. And this is so due to some uh, previous literature that was showing that the presence of predatory produce can really beneficially influence plant growth. And this was explained through two main mechanisms. And one of them was firstly, describing the aquatic system, and this is about uh, microbial, the microbial loop. So when you have a predators in your system, you get more nutrients released. And this is really a, like in sort of nutshell. So of course, if you don't have predators, you have bacteria feeding on nutrients and they keep the nutrients in themselves as long as they are alive. But when you have a predator, the predator is making their life a bit shorter and some nutrients get released a bit quicker in the system. So everything is a bit um, fast enough. But there is also a second mechanism. And this is a change in the bacterial community composition. And this can be due to, uh, this is a two slide story. So of course you have some bacteria or some prey that are better off, they are better at defending themselves. So in presence of predators, they will have an ad advantage compared to other bacteria that are not so good at defending themselves. But we also have some parties that do prefer to feed on certain bacteria and not the other. So due to this, these choices of either the bacteria or the predators, the produce, you will have a change in your community. And this is something we wanted to look at a bit further. And we had a couple of questions. Uh, so thinking back about the diversity that we have in produce, uh, we wanted to see if we can uh, see food preferences and predatory impact as at the taxon specific level of produce. So are specific produce isolates, uh, do they vary in their food preference? Can we also predict that maybe through some measurable traits that we can uh, have for this produce? And so do this food preference relate at all to predatory impact in a more complex system. So that's what we wanted to look at. And we had to select some products. Of course, I show you that there are quite many. Uh, we couldn't take all of them. So we had to make some choices. And we decided to take eight isolates from our collection. So we had quite a big collection of, of products. And we decided to take some parties that were um, closely related in terms of the phylogeny and so a bit dis more distant related. So here you have the eukaryotic supergroup. We took four of them from this group and each time we took two that were closely related. So we have two Akenta amoeba and two vanilla, for instance. They also had different growth rates and they had different volumes. So in this way, we try to look at different traits and if these traits may have a certain impact in the feeding preferences. And here I'm just showing you, so again, a bit the same story. It's just for you to, um, to see a bit how far related they are compared to each other. So this is just a figure, a representation of a phylogenetic tree of the eukaryotes. I also put in transparency here the plants, the land plants. We have the metazoa, the fungi, and all the rest are put together under the term of protist. And here you can see we took uh, the four protists from this big group, then we had two protists from this group and two other protists from this group. So just that you have a bit of a, an overview. And how we then started our experiment. So we wanted to look into feeding patterns, as I said before. And for that, we decided to, to do a sort of, to use a quite artificial system. We had our eight protists and we grew them on 20 different bacteria that we were, we also had quite some characterization for this bacteria. 
And we wanted to monitor how well the protists would grow on this bacteria as a proxy to say this food is a good food, good food source or a bad food source for this protist. And this was a quantification by microscopy. And this is so maybe, I don't know how many of you have counted protists on a microscope, but this is a, time, a quite time consuming activity. So that also explained that we had only, only eight protists here. So just so that you know. But they are amazing to see under a microscope, so do so if you have a chance. Um, and here, just to show you a bit, um, sort of the results already from this part, from the feeding patterns. So you have on the x-axis the different uh, bacterial species, and on the uh, epsilon axis you have the different parties. How to read this heat map is to see that when you have a blue color, it means that this parties could grow pretty well on this bacteria. When you have something more orange, yellow, the protists could not grow so well on this bacteria. And this is the first data so that we got. And we wanted to understand a bit further what, what it means and to characterize it a bit further. And to do so, we, we made a couple of uh, analysis. So we looked at the coefficient of variation. We did, that's the standard deviation over the mean, and we did it per protist. And that was to try to understand how I call it how picky a protist is. And uh, so to see how, if you had a bit of the dietary niche breath to try to, to understand if your protists really only feed on one uh, specific bacteria and almost not at all on the other, or if your protist is a bit more generalist and feeding a bit the same on all of them. So that was the idea behind. And we also looked at the Euclidean distance between the protists to see if they had uh, similar feeding patterns, if they were feeding similarly well on the same protist or, or not. And I mentioned so, uh, when we selected our protist, we had different traits that we looked at. And that was the phy phylogenetic distance, growth rate, and volume. And we looked at this if these traits were correlated to the feeding preferences we got. So that's for this part. And I'm just showing you a bit of the main sort of results characterization we got from there. And we found that most of the protists we studied here, these eight protists, were rather generally generalist. They had relatively a broad dietary niche, so there were no extreme protists who would only feed on one bacteria. And we found, looking at the Euclidean distance, the feeding patterns and protist traits, that most of uh, that the growth rate was potentially important in explaining these feeding patterns. And this is one part of it. So this is part one. So feeding patterns, how we can characterize them. And in the second part, we wanted to look at the predatory impact of protists. And for that, we took the same protist and we added them uh, in soil microcosm, and this time in five replicates. And we looked at the change in bacterial community composition via sequencing of uh, amplicon sequencing. And this work has been actually entirely done by one of my colleagues, uh, Jill Egao, who is also co-author of this paper. So credit to her for uh, putting all of this together. That's quite some work. And from that, again, we tried to look at the, we characterize the predatory impacts. And first here, I just was searching a way to present to you uh, the data. So I, I went for these rainbow colors. Um, we have the, that's the alpha diversity of uh, our communities in the different treatments. So you have the control and the different uh, treatments. I won't stay here on this too long, but just you can see that you have a dominance, for instance, of proteobacteria in our system. Then you had bacteroidetes and actinobacteria then. And again, similarly from the other, uh, from the feeding patterns here, we try to look a bit further and to see how we can maybe characterize this impact. And here we decided to look into the nearest taxon index. And this value, this analysis can, uh, can help you understanding if you're having a phylogenetic clustering or over dispersion in your data. And we wanted to look into that to see if we had phylogenetic clustering, especially because we this would suggest the domination of deterministic processes. And we thought of predation as a, something that would be quite deterministic, especially if you have one part is quite specialized into feeding in, like we would really prefer to feed on certain bacteria. That way you would really lose this bacteria in all your system, given you have this bacteria in all the systems. So that was one of the aspects. 
And then we also look into, uh, we've, we looked at the break curtis dissimilarity um, relative to the control, this to indicate if we actually had an impact of our predators. So we looked into changes in community composition compared to the control. And so uh, co compared to each other to see if two different products would have a similar impact or dissimilar impact. And we also wanted to go a bit further because we found this uh, big beta diversity information uh, maybe a bit too broad to really see what's happening in our system. So we also decided to try an analysis and to look into an analysis to make differential expression. Uh, that's with the DSEC package in, uh, in R for the one of you who are, uh, who are familiar. And we can see here the log twofold changes of uh, the OTUs in the treatments compared to the control. So here I'm only showing to, I'm only presenting two of these graphs. I have eight, one for each of the treatment, but we won't go into details in that. In there, I just wanted to, to present them because it, it does give a nice view of how uh, potentially each protease is having sort of a fingerprint of a predatory impact. But especially if you look at this OTU level, you may be able to to find interesting, um, interesting OTUs that are maybe always increased with one parties or always decreased with one parties. And I think we can go a bit further if we go into this direction. Even though uh, that's also difficult to make sense out of this data. So I think it's a nice direction to go and let's see how far we can go. We didn't do much more here than to see they are different. We can definitely see that uh, at the, at the level of the ETUs, each, each of the parties is having this sort of, this sort of uh, fingerprint um, predatory impact. So here just to summarize a bit and to come back to the NTI because I didn't get uh, a result there yet. So for the NTI, this nearest taxon index, we couldn't really find any uh, clear uh, direction. So we had for all of our our communities uh, NTI that was higher than two and was similar for all our treatments, including the control. So probably, or I, we don't know exactly, but maybe just our system was sort of deterministic in the way we, we, we did our experiment. So didn't really help us to, uh, to understand our system, but still a very interesting approach, uh, I would say. And when we look at the Brecartis dissimilarity and the log two fold changes, as I say, here we could definitely say, each of our parties is having a significant and distinct change in the bacterial community. So that was very interesting for us to see. And now we wanted to go further. So we have these feeding patterns, this predatory impact that we try to characterize um, in different ways. And we want to see if actually do they, do they match? Do, do they relate to each other in some way or another? And for this, we had also uh, two different main hypotheses. It's a bit of a lot of text, but I couldn't find a way to make it shorter. So bear with me. <laughs> we had this first idea that a protist with a relatively narrow dietary niche breast, so a protist who would be maybe more a bit of a specialist. This is what I'm trying to illustrate here with this. This would be a flagellate and really likes this orange bacteria, but not so much the other bacteria. And we would expect that when we have such a situation, then when we go and look at the impact on the community, we would have a bit of a stronger impact and a bit more, yeah, clear impact there because then you have maybe all then the yellow bacteria that were similar to the orange one that just disappeared for your system. While on the other side, when you have maybe a bit of a broader dietary niche breath, you have a protist with just feeding kind of the same on all of them. And then you may not be able to detect a very strong change in your community compared to a community without predators. And to look at that, we uh, tried to, to correlate the brachiotis dissimilarity relative to control and or the NTI to our coefficient of variation. So just as a reminder, so our coefficient of variation is a proxy for the dietary niche breath and the NTI and brachiotis dissimilarity are representing or in indicating or hmm, sorry, or proxy of the uh, predatory impact, the magnitude of the predatory impact. And as you can see here, there is no big relation. 
So, but that doesn't make sense uh, as we saw that our forties were all more or less generalist, and we didn't find a very strong um, direction in their in their impact. So, in that way, I think this hypothesis we can say that it was rather not what we were expecting. But it's also not exactly uh, surprising, I think. So we can expect um, this to happen. But then the second one was to look into if we have a similar produce that have a similar feeding patterns, that is, do these produces to have a similar impact on the soil bacterial community? Because that would be also very interesting in, um, in various ways. I will uh, say more about it in a bit. And here we did find that that was the case. So we did find that produce with similar feeding patterns did have similar predatory impact. And this might not be the best figure to show. And if you have some suggestions, I'm happy to, to get them. I couldn't find a better way to present this data, I think. But this is a PCA using pairwise distances. And here we are explaining the variation in our, uh, in our communities uh, with different traits, different variables. And we can see that the feeding patterns, the growth rates, and the predatory impact are all clustering together to explain uh, more than 50% of the variation in our system. And then we have also the volume and distance, phylogenetic distance explains, explaining uh, on the, another axis of our system. I'm just keeping an eye on the time, but I think I should be fine. And I'm coming to the end. So. Here we could say that, yes, we had the similar feeding patterns have similar impacts. And now I will come to my conclusion. So here I just wanted to, or like if I have some sort of uh, messages for you to keep after this talk, is that um, in our case, this parties had a relatively broad dietary niche, uh, dietary niche breath, but that didn't, ma didn't mean that it didn't have very distinct feeding patterns and predatory impacts. So, uh, you can feed on different, on quite a broad um, community, but still have a distinct uh, impact in your system. And I do think so if you, uh, especially, we also just heard it from the, from the previous talk that soil is very heterogeneous and you actually better do not specialize in the system, otherwise you will probably starve quite quickly. So that does completely make sense that soil predatory parties would not specialize too much in the system. And another point that I found quite important and interesting is I think that we can really use artificial system like our feeding pattern uh, essay to study microbial life strategies of diverse parties. So we can use um, artificial system and then relate them, them to more complex systems. And this can really help us to uh, go further and, and understand better all these different um, yeah, systems. So, with that, I think I will come to the acknowledgement, otherwise I'm running out of time. I uh, just want to thank the um, people of the group I was during my PhD, the Ecology and Biodiversity Group at the Utrecht University. And all this work was supported by an NVO grant from the Netherlands. Special thanks, of course, to all the co-author of this paper and to the organizer of this webinar, and also to my uh, current organization who is allowing me to give this nice presentation and to all of you for your attention, thanks. Thank you very much, Natalie. Very interesting. I also, again, have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to uh, save these for later. And of course, everybody else, please uh, type in your question to the Q&A and we'll get back to them. So no, really interesting in terms of how bacteria are, are, are food. So uh, our next speaker is Eric Wright from uh, University of Pittsburgh and looking at model communities and multi-stable bacterial communities and how they are infected by the conditions of, of the system. So Eric, okay, I see you got your camera back on and hopefully you can get your presentation up and we'll get you started. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to do this real quick. Let's see if that works. Okay. Looks good. Okay, looks good. Thank you. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Eric Wright. I'm from the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Pittsburgh. I'll be presenting to you today some work I did um, actually in the laboratory of Kaleem Batsigian 
at uh, the University of Wisconsin with a postdoc named, or sorry, an um, undergraduate named Ravina Gupta, who's now a PhD student at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. But the main stars of our show are actually these guys, the Streptomyces. And if you have never heard of the Streptomyces, they're a very cool genus of bacteria, as you can see, incredibly morphologically diverse. Um, all sorts of different uh, colors because they are well known for producing antibiotics. And they are um, ubiquitous in soil. They, uh, if you take a grain of soil that is microscopic, uh, you can get hundreds of Streptomyces colonies on selective medium, as you see here. And this is basically just a starch and auger medium. They're happy to grow on that and even just on starch. And that's because they're saprophytes and they break down decaying organic matter in nature. That's their um, sort of role. And they uh, so they can grow on very, very little um, nutrient. They're well known for making antibiotics. Each strain produces on the order of 50 um, different natural products. And we can see that from their genome, but many of these are actually silent in the laboratory. So we're unable to express them um, or haven't found the conditions to do so. And the amazing thing about them is that there's very little overlap between strains. So if you took two different uh, streptomyces from what I just showed you from the same soil sample, you'd see from their biosynthetic gene clusters they encode, there's, there's very few antibiotics that they actually would share. And um, because of that, they have this enormous diversity of antibiotics. They produce about a little over half of the antibiotics that we use in the clinic right now. So if you've taken an antibiotic before, there's a good chance it came from a streptomyces or a fungi originally. And not only that, but because they are also the major antibiotic producers, they are also the major source of resistance, right? Because they can't kill themselves with their own antibiotics. So they develop these resistance mechanisms that happen to be sort of the lowest cost resistance mechanisms that are possible. And uh, because of that, they are both the producers of antibiotics that we then use in the clinic, but they are also the uh, source of many of the resistance mechanisms that you see in the clinic. But the reason I'm talking to you about them here today is because they have a very cool life cycle. And we've been able to link some of the results that we've seen to, to their life cycle. You can think of that life cycle as starting as a free spore. And this uh, spore, if it lands in the right condition, will germinate. And one of the things that Colleen's lab did a lot of, including myself when I was uh, there, is we studied this germination process because it's heavily regulated. Once they germinate, they grow down into the substrate. And uh, actually, if you if they germinate an auger, you can actually cut the auger with a, a razor blade and you can see that they grow down into it quite deeply, sometimes a centimeter. And after some period of time, they make some developmental switch where they decide to grow back out of the auger into what's called aerial mycelium. They switch from a filamentous growth strategy to um, developing spores. So the filaments that contain about 40 different genomes that are only loosely compartmentalized and there's not uh, a ton known about how they're compartmentalized, but there's newer work showing that they are. Um, eventually they, they septate and once they do, they become individual spores and uh, they can disperse in the environment, okay? So this, this step of germination and the step of sporulation are both heavily regulated and very important to their life cycle. What we were interested in doing is understanding how Streptomyces would assemble um, in a natural habitat. And we imagine them as first starting off with these free spores that were dispersed to some new food source. And because they're saprophytes, that might be a, a leaf or it might be um, you know, a piece of wood that fell on the forest floor and now is ready to be decayed. And so they arrive there presumably quasi-randomly. And then over time, they uh, grow and the environment will select for which ones are capable of growing in that particular niche. And also they can inhibit each other because of all these different natural products that they encode. And that leaves behind some final community that then presumably goes on to uh, inhabit new fresh habitats when another leaf falls on the forest floor. So um, you can imagine that this process is happening all the time and we want to understand it and understand how communities assemble in nature. And really, there's two ways that uh, people have studied microbes uh, most of the time, and that is through natural systems, and which, of course, are extremely complex, difficult to manipulate. They're coupled to other complex systems, and it's very difficult to measure interactions 
uh, in nature, although not impossible, it's, it's not as easy to manipulate them. Or pure cultures, uh, and most microbiologists, you know, study individual organisms, E. coli, K12, or something like this in a petri dish. And so this doesn't tell you that much about their um, community context. And so in order to sort of bridge this divide between natural systems, which are too complicated and coupled to other complex systems, and pure cultures, which are too simplistic to study communities, we wanted to develop synthetic communities. And there's basically two ways that people go about doing this. One is through a top-down approach where you take a natural system and you constrain it by um, allowing it to grow on some resource in the laboratory typically, or sometimes in people's bathtubs. There's all sorts of different experiments that have been done. And that reduces the community to some um, alternative community that is a subset of the original membership and creates a synthetic community, some of which are sustainable. Or pure cultures in which you start with a few organisms and you try to assemble them bottom up. And the challenge of this is that lots of times you run into competitive exclusion so that you only end up with one organism in the end. So we decided to take a pure culture approach and we wanted to understand basically everything we could about a small subset of organisms. So we started off with a panel of strains, which I'll be representing as these sort of circles that are colored to represent different colors of strains. We measured a bunch of different attributes about them, their growth rate, their yield in terms of number of spores they could produce or biomass they could produce, their lag time, things like this. And then we collected pairwise information. So we collected their competitive ability, um, whether they're able to invade each other, which I'll spend most of my time talking about today, and also whether they can inhibit each other. And we wanted to uh, link their inhibition to, to their ability to invade if, if there was any sort of relationship there, we wanted to understand that. And then we sought to capture multi-species abundances over time. So if you put a bunch of different um, assemblage of, of community members together, what happens if you just let them sort of grow together? Uh, what do you observe as their dynamics? And then we wanted to be able to model this. So ideally, if we could understand the system, then we'd be able to construct models that could sort of recapitulate those dynamics. And so to do that, we, we ran this experiment that was rather simple. And, and when I first started this work, I was somewhat amazed that this isn't um, something that had been done. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out if people had done it in like the 60s or something, and I, I just wasn't able to, to find such a thing. So, so we did a, a relatively simple uh, experiment where we took a small fraction of one strain, about one one thousandth of the community, and we put it with another. We call them the invader and the resident, so the resident is the one that's the majority of the, of the community. And we embed them into auger within um, a test tube, and that test tube is basically lined with auger. I'll show you how that process works in a second. They grow inside the auger, and they go to the top, and they form aerial mycelium, and then they sporulate as part of their life cycle. Then we would harvest and freeze these spores and repeat this process. And the neat thing about this is we didn't need to do this too many times. Actually, the dynamics played out very quickly in almost all cases, and uh, within about three propagation cycles, you would uh, observe a final outcome that we were, were able to confirm in many cases that it would last for basically forever because you ended up with just one strain or coexistence or something of the sort. So in our first experiment here, which was published in Nature Communication a few years ago, um, we use DNA sequencing to tell the population abundances. So we got relative abundance out of that. We sequenced the RPOB, the RNA polymerase um, subunit beta gene, and we observed the relative abundance over time, starting from some um, majority strain, which was uh, shown here in green. And then we looked at whether a minority strain could invade it. So we called this the invader. And you can imagine that there's three possible outcomes. You could have survival of the fittest. So that is, if the purple strain can dominate the green strain, then if you put the purple at low abundance, it can invade. If you put the purple at high abundance, it can maintain its ground. And so we would say there's a hierarchy between these two strains. And this is sort of what we went into this uh, expecting to see the majority of this. And then the next we um, outcome you might imagine is survival of everybody, which is if you have uh, two strains that can coexist together, then either one as a minority would eventually reach some equilibrium. And so we represent this with a double-headed arrow to say they can both invade each other. And a third possibility is that you can imagine um, we could observe survival of the common, which is that the more common strain is the one to take over the community. And this results in bistability in that if you start with the green strain as the invader, it 
is able to, or it loses ground. And if you start with the purple strain as the invader, then it loses ground. And so whoever is the most common ends up winning. And we represent this with a, a dotted N-word um, double-headed arrow. So we expected to see mostly survival of the fittest, but these are the three possible outcomes you can imagine. And then once you have that for a panel of strains, you can con construct a pairwise invasion network. And that pairwise invasion network might be hierarchical, where you have um, one strain that sort of rules them all, and one strain at the bottom that's beaten by all of them, at least in your laboratory community. And you would imagine that if you put all these strains together, all four of them, from knowing the pairwise data, you'd be able to predict that the purple strain would win. And you could also imagine a network where you had some arrows that went against the hierarchy. And so you might have loops in your network. And these loops are thought to maintain diversity in natural ecosystems. Or you could imagine that the notion of hierarchy entirely does not apply to the system because you have arrows pointed in all different directions and of all different types. And, um, and so you can't arrange these uh, particular strains, at least in this setting, into a hierarchy where one is better than the other. And so to do this, we started with a panel of 18 different streptomyces. Here's how they all, all the ones different look. Um, all of them are streptomyces except one strain, which is strain number one, which was an amicolotopsis, which is a related genus. And we threw that in there because it was, um, we were interested in what happens if we put in a non-streptomyces. And we had two replicates of the strain. And all the others, um, we had one uh, starting from each initial condition. So we also included, most of these I should mention are from the same soil sample, except strain 13, which is Streptomyces coelacolor. And this uh, strain is well known to Streptomyces people because it's sort of the canonical Streptomyces. So this is how we ran the experiment. We um, injected them in molten auger and we built this contraption that basically blows air over the molten auger while it solidifies and it rotates at about 1800 rpm and actually the uh the motor here that's driving this is our our lab technicians um laundry machine that had broken down so we made a, a motor out of it we had these o-rings and this was quite a system trying to do this in high throughput and we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tubes every few days so so it was uh a lot of um, work to get this this working correctly uh, and kind of a neat thing. Uh, and then once the tubes solidify, this is what a negative control looks like. So there's nothing in here except auger. And so it looks more or less clear. And this is what it looks like once the bacteria are in it. So you see a lot of bacteria growing on the inside. And then at this point, they've sporulated. And then we would inject in um, a glycerol stock for freezing and uh, harvest the strains. So this is the outcome of this experiment. We measured all possible pairwise invasions between every combination of two strains. And you can see the invader here on the x-axis, the resonate here on the y-axis. And if there's an invasion, it's shown in red. And what you immediately notice is we had a lot of invasions. And we can categorize those into our three different categories. You can have bi-stability. So here, strain four was the invader, was not able to invade strain nine. And when strain nine was the invader, it was not able to invade strain four. So you can see that by looking at um, cells that are symmetrical across the, the diagonal here. And we also can see that uh, cases of coexistence. So for example, strain one is able to invade strain 17. The strain 17 is able to invade strain one. And we can see cases of hierarchy. So strain 12 is able to invade strain 14. And strain 14 is not able to invade strain 12. So we have hierarchy between those strains where 12 is presumably more competitive or fitter in this um, particular system. When we broke those down into our different possible types, our three, our three possibilities, we saw that the um, bi-stable pairs were actually much, much, much more common than we originally expected. And this sort of blew our mind and was sort of our first major result that, wow, we were onto something here. This is, this is neat. We expected a lot of hierarchy. Instead, we saw a lot of bi-stability. And actually, I'm not going to have time to talk about today, but we link this bi-stability to their ability to produce antibiotics. So, so their natural products, that their ability to inhibit each other um, results in this bi-stability. And that's, that's one thing, we, if you're interested, you could look at the paper and learn more about that. But if we take all of these and then we try to construct a hierarchy of strains and say who's higher in this hierarchy than, than um, the other strains, we see that we end up with a hierarchy like this. And this was based off of an algorithm that was done to form hierarchy in social networks. 
that we sort of um, copied to, to figure out whether our data shows a hierarchy. And the surprising thing to us was that a lot of strains were at the same level of the hierarchy. So, so it was somewhat flat. Um, there was no winner. There were actually six different winners. And if we look at the, if we overlay the invasion results on top of that, there, here's the arrows of who can invade who, we see that these, these strains at the top of the hierarchy can't invade each other. And mostly, as you would expect for a hierarchy, um, most of the strains can inhibit the, the or sorry, most of the strains at the top can inhibit the ones at the bottom. If we actually look at which arrows go against the direction of the hierarchy where we see invasions that we don't expect that are um, not conforming with the, the um, sort of competitive hierarchy that we developed, there's a few of them and almost all of those are with strain one, which was able to coexist with most other strains. And this is the strain, if you'll recall, that was an amicalotopsis. So we saw a lot of coexistence with the amicalotopsis and almost all the streptomyces were not able to coexist with each other. If we overlay by stability on the network, you can see there's a lot of it. And actually, these bistable pairs are enriched for inhibitions. So this was a really interesting thing and, and um, ended up being a more surprising result than, than what we expected when we set out. But there were some limitations to this work, which is why we did another study. So the first thing is that we started at this 1 to 1,000 initial ratio, which is somewhat extreme. And we don't, we're not able from that to tell exactly where the boundary of bistability is. This is also known as the separatix. Um, Secondly, it's difficult to derive dynamics from the sequencing data. These, they're relative abundances, and we would ideally like absolute abundances for modeling. And then thirdly, we never tried more than two strain communities, so we couldn't answer the question of whether the bistability that we observed propagated to multistability. So what we did is we, for the FIMS microbiology ecology paper, we reduced the number of strains, and we looked at more starting conditions. But we did it in a special way in that because we wanted absolute abundances and we couldn't figure out a way to get that from sequencing without all the inherent sequencing bias and PCR bias and whatnot, we decided to count the strains. So this was quite a laborious experiment. I wish I had taken pictures of myself with all the Petri dishes because we had piles and piles and piles and piles of Petri dishes, so many boxes of Petri dishes trying to count these strains at different concentrations to get absolute abundances. And we chose these particular five strains because the amicolotopsis showed some interesting behavior. Strain two was pink, which I thought was neat. Um, strain three turns blue, this deep blue. Um, strain four is sort of a salmon color and strain five is, is gray. Um, and so we kept their naming the same as our original paper. So we have one, two, 13, 15, 17. And we chose them because they're, they exhibited interesting behaviors. Uh, in our first study, these three were at the top of the hierarchy and the top level there with the six winners. And um, they're totally different colors from each other. And so we wanted to know, um, we, want, we were able to uh, look at them on Petri dishes and pull them apart from each other. So we did all possible pairs, all possible triples, and a subset of quadruples. And then we constructed, um, once again, the invasion network. And what you can see is starting from different initial conditions, those are the points here. These are the pairs of strains, so strain one and strain 17. If we look at those, starting from different initial conditions, more of one, less of 17, more of 17, more of one, and here in the middle, an equal amount of 17, one. Our final outcome after three propagation cycles is everybody moves towards this sort of central attractor, and that is uh, between strain one and 17, so there's, there's both strains still present, and these two are able to coexist. We saw that if you mix together one and 15, you almost always get 15 in the end after three propagation cycles. And so these two strains show um, uh, a competitive hierarchy where strain 15 is able to dominate strain one. And interestingly, the point of bistability between 15 and 17, you can see is right here. So this separates the region where if you have slightly more of strain 17, you fall towards 17 as your final condition. If you have slightly more of 15, you fall towards 15 as your final condition. So we did this for um, both the pairs and which we had already done previously, but now we have more, um, more starting conditions. We also did this for points inside the triangle which are showing you if we put together three strains. And you can see that this region of bistability propagates throughout the entire triangle. So, so here in the center, you have a point where everybody is at equal abundance. And actually at that point, the two replicates diverge, which was really quite amazing. We actually sampled this densely enough to find that our replicates would diverge to different final solutions. And 
that was pretty remarkable to us. And you see that in a couple of cases here where they, they start at the same initial condition. We have two replicates and they diverge to different final conditions. But this bistability propagated to multistability. But you can still see the basins of attraction here. They're, they're quite clear. And um, it's really neat to see these, uh, you know, in, in high definition, um, given that this is a well-studied thing in ecology, these basins of attraction, a lot of it's done through theory. And if we do this for all possible triangles uh, between our five different strains, here's the outcome. And you can see that we have a bunch of different attractors. I think here there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different attractors. And uh, there's a large region of, of bistability between several of the strains. So this was really cool. And this showed that the, the bistability that we observed and in pairwise um, communities propagated to multi-species communities and so we want to know, does this keep going to four species? We did that, and uh, these are points now inside the triangles. And so here in the, in the middle of the pyramid, we're starting from four different um, strains. And you can see that, once again, we have the different attractors. And, and the final solution is, is quite different, depending on just slight changes in the initial condition. And actually, at this one point here, you can see they diverge to different final solutions. And in case you're a bit skeptical of this and thinking that um, this must be crazy or artifactual, you can actually see it in the tubes is one of the amazing things. So we have these test tubes, they're embedded with our communities, and this is after three cycles, and this is my, my nomenclature. So we have, strain, we have um, community 206A and 206B. These are two different replicates starting from strains 1, 13, 15, and 17, and they diverge after three cycles. They, remember, they start from the exact same volume. It's literally mixed together. And we take a pipette, take 100 microliters of it out, and inject it in two different tubes, and that's how they begin. And they end up with dramatically different communities. So here you can see strain 13. Strain 1 is still present in, in low abundance here. And here you can see strain 17. It's sort of salmon colored there. And you can see strain 1 in, in slightly higher abundance there. So, so this is a remarkable um, you know, visual confirmation of, of what we observe from that central point starting with four for communities. And, and, and we were able to see this in the tube. So it was, it was really neat to, to be able to watch this experiment, not just through sequencing, but to be able to see it happen. And then finally, we, we did quite a large modeling study where we, we um, which only some of which we published, which is we published the Locke of Voltaire part of it, but we also tried to model it in other ways. And we were able to model it better than Locke of Voltaire, but we never ended up publishing that because we had constructed all sorts of crazy models and we weren't sure anyone else would, would be interested in them. But um, starting from each of the different initial conditions, you can see Laca Voltaire is able to qualitatively capture most of the, the outcomes. And so the points here are the real data, the lines here are Laca Voltaire predictions, and it's colored based off of how bad the prediction is. And, and notice that the, the axis is in log space, so this is the final spore abundance after some number of propagation cycles. And in some cases, it, it did very poorly, right? So here it thinks blue wins, but actually green wins, and, and green it thinks green goes away, but green won. So, and you end up finding that these are near the, the boundaries between the basins of attraction. And so, so an optimized lock of Voltaire system, which contains many parameters, you have um, a parameter, a rate parameter for each strain for its individual growth rate, and then you have interaction parameters for every pair of strains. So it's, it's a highly parameterized model. It's still not able to fully recapitulate the, the dynamics. And not only that, but I guess another point to emphasize is that the quantitative dynamics are way off. So, so take a look here um, at this strain. This is strain one, so our amicolotopsis grown by itself after one propagation cycle shoots to 10 to the eighth spores. Um, per mil, and, and instead we have, uh, or sorry, CFU per tube, and instead here you see that Laca Voltaire is expecting this slow rise and eventual plateauing, and so it, it's just orders of magnitude off, especially in the, the first propagation cycles, and we were able to construct models that fit this data better, but um, we ultimately didn't publish them because they were a bit, a bit custom, and, uh, but they sometimes had fewer parameters. So Laca Voltaire, which is well known to ecologists, did okay, but not um, superbly on this particular data. With that, I'd like to acknowledge our different funding sources and um, uh, that funded this particular project. And also, if anyone's interested, I have my own group now, and you can look us up. We study antibiotics, so an easier problem in some sense is antibiotic resistance than modeling microbial communities, which is, uh, as you can see here, quite quite complicated. And I think that's really the takeaway from all of this is that 
Streptomyces, um, even in small systems with just four or five strains, are incredibly complex. So you can imagine the real dynamics when you have thousands of strains in, in a true microbial community in nature with a lot more coupled systems like the weather and other things that are interacting with these strains. Uh, you have um, incredibly complicated dynamics, and that should be no surprise when you can get such complex dynamics even from smaller systems. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this was great. And thank you also, Natalie and Damien, uh, overall, really interesting. And I, I really started to first think of uh, the quip from um, Jim Proster from a few years back, because why do we have this ridiculous diversity of microorganisms in soils and other systems? And it's interesting to look at, yeah, what are some of the drivers, I mean, from competition between strains closely related to each other, depredation, um, as well as then, of course, uh, metabolic interaction. So, so really, really interesting and, and very different approaches. So yeah, we'll, we have time some uh, discussion. Uh, there are a few questions here already in the Q&A. And so we have about 15 minutes to go through some of them, probably not all. Uh, so yeah, Natalie and Damon, if you'll also join, we can, uh, then uh, start start the discussion. And what I was wondering, yeah, this is one from uh, Maria Martino. This is actually going back to uh, Damien. This question of oxytrophs, are they cheaters? What's going on here if you think of, of this aspect of, of feeding? Are they giving back to the organism that is providing the amino acid or something else? I was uh, looking at your question in the Q&A, Maria, and trying to think how I would best respond to it, actually. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I didn't come to a good conclusion there. Uh, I think uh, often it can go several different ways. Either you can have a microbe that over time has like streamlined its genome and it's lost so much of this extra stuff that it needs that, yes, it probably does become a cheetah and then it doesn't uh, provide anything useful to the community. And then um, that's sort of one outcome. But I think another outcome is possible. I like this um, hypothesis, it's called the division of labor hypothesis, whereby uh, and two different organisms, they've lost complementary growth factors and then they have to sort of like live together in a more mutualistic sort of scenario. Um, I don't know in the real world how uh, frequent one of those other sort of like, you know, possibilities might be. Um, if I can trick people into giving me money, I would like to answer that though, yeah. Oh, and actually, and there's a follow-up. This is actually from, uh, yeah, Petra Stefan on the deep biosphere. And this is again, going into severe nutrient limitations. I mean, you're looking at systems and soils where there's actually often a plentiful, uh, amount of nutrients. But as you go to more limiting systems, you see this mutual uh, cross-feeding becoming really more and more important. And what's the evidence of that? Uh, I'm not entirely certain about the very deep biosphere. I have seen uh, some papers where there are these, uh, this phylum Petisi bacteria that seem to make up quite a large proportion of um, communities from some of these sort of groundwater or deep biosphere sort of um, environments. And they always seem to have suspiciously tiny genomes. So uh, very much these might be organisms that have, um, that live that sort of cheetah lifestyle and then they're forced to either find a good partner that they have to live with uh, in the deep biosphere or maybe they just get a lot of um, sort of like groundwater or mineral flow from more rich active sort of environments. And if those um, uh, substrates can make it down to the deep biosphere, maybe they're just relying on that. But I, I probably don't think that's a very um, safe way to live. It would be very risky indeed. Yep. So uh, let's see, Satya Singh has a question regarding predators. I mean, what's the basis for predators eating specific bacteria? I mean, I guess surface recognition or so on. And I wanted to add onto this question, thinking of it from the perspective of the bacteria, 
are there some that just taste bad and therefore evade predation versus in terms of, of what is the feeding preference of, of the, uh, of the uh, protists? Thanks for the question. That's a, a nice one. <laughs> yeah, so for uh, there are like different ways of why protists would um, feed on one or the other bacteria. So indeed, there is some surface, surface recognition for some of them. So some parties are able to recognize some bacteria and they then decide they want to feed on them or not. We expect that there is also some stoichiometry importance there, but we don't know exactly which bacteria are preferred or not. And so um, I'm, I'm coming then next to the other question. I'm saying bacteria all the time, but I just want to make clear that predatory proteins are not only feeding on bacteria. They're just the most common, uh, the mostly studied organism, but proteins can also feed on other organisms, including other protists. Just that not people think now that protists are only feeding on bacteria, that would be wrong. And if they taste bad, bad, I guess so, because some of them do produce some toxins that can not only taste bad, but be deadly. So some protists are also able to, some, to, yeah, to sense that, and then they would avoid this toxic bacteria. I guess that answered the questions, hopefully. So I wonder that whether that also links with antibiotic production or some of these, I mean, for example, streptomyces and so on in there. At, at least we had some, we have another paper on that actually, and we could find some good correlation with this. That's a, if a bacteria was able to, it was with pseudomonas, but if the bacteria is able to produce antibiotics, it has bigger chances to not be eaten by the protist. Okay, yeah, I'm just noticing another question from Lily Young. I think it's mainly to Eric. And I think she's asking to complicate your experimental setup even more in terms of, okay, you have multiple strains competing, but this is one of showing that, uh, yeah, even two strains, depending on the concentration of the substrate, the competition outcome will be different. So again, you have scavengers and so on. So how do you see this? adding to your multi-strain uh, competition if you now have nutrient limitations? Yeah, so we didn't test that. Uh, it's definitely a major factor. The medium that we used was starch media. It contains a few salts and um, primarily, I think it's one gram of starch per liter. So it's, uh, highly reduced, very few things will grow on it. Um, and we never tested other types of media. We're, I mean, we, we did, uh, but we didn't publish any of it. And we know that it has a big impact. So you can change the, um, you can change the, the outcomes of competitions by, by changing the media for sure. So yes, more more dimensions into your model. Um, this is going to be be interesting in how to keep track of of all of this. Uh, let's see. There was also regarding the predation. Uh, so Natalie, you looked at protist uh, and then their feeding of, of bacteria. What about the other way around? I mean, I know there are nematode trapping fungi, uh, but what about bacterial predation of of the protists? That's potentially a good one. Um, I don't know any research about that. I wouldn't know. Well, I mean, we know that some bacteria can kill the protists via toxin production, but that they would then feed on the protists. I wouldn't know that, no. Um, we see some other interaction with other system um, that there are some protists that can feed on nematodes, for instance. So nematodes can feed on protists, but some protists can also feed on nematodes. But otherwise, yeah, I don't know, something to research, I guess, <laughs> to see. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely under the microscope, I've seen us have that once a protist dies, you have a zoo of bacteria accumulating around there and probably feeding on, on the uh, substrates, but are they specifically killing it or just waiting for, for that big protist to, to uh, collapse? That's a good question, because you also have um, uh, endophytes, so it's some bacteria are so living inside the protease. So maybe they could also try to kill the protease from inside to feed on it. I don't know. I really, I, I don't know many research on that. So, but it's a good one.
Okay, I'm sorting through. Are there others here that you've noticed that you want to jump in at? I would just want to say one more thing because I saw somewhere um, a question about some sort of extremophile protease. And there are some protists that can only, there are some ciliates, I think, that can only feed on spores of fungi, and they really have a, only a, the specific enzyme for that. So this is what does exist. So we do have some very highly specialized uh, predatory protists. It goes really, I think, in all the directions, so for the protists uh, in this diverse group. So just wanted to add on that. Okay, yeah, and then one is, of course, thinking about the interactions even beyond our systems. Um, this is from Connie Smala on fungal hyphae that, of course, often get connected with specific bacteria that are growing on that. What about streptomyces and so on? Are there other bacteria that are typically associated with them? I mean, how would that fit? Yeah, so I don't know of... Uh, um a nutrient exchange that's been well studied between streptomyces and other bacteria. And I, I may be remiss in not remembering. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure. I don't know of any correlations between other organisms and streptomyces. Um, I can tell you that one rather interesting thing that is it's still unknown why it is the case is that both fungi and streptomyces are our main sources of natural products, right? And uh, and so why would that be? They both inhabit a similar niche as saprophytes. They both compete with each other. Um, they both grow filamentously and uh, they both have long linear genomes. And so, so it's, it's quite a lot of, um, you know, associations, but, but uh, to my knowledge, no one, no one has a, um, a certain answer as to why that is the case, but it's thought that the streptomyces and fungi, because they, uh, because they are these sort of keystone species in degrading organic matter, they digest it extracellularly. And because of that, uh, need to protect their food because they're basically breaking down these large polymers into things that can get inside cells. And once they've done that work, they now can um, have competitors come in and, and take the, the outcome of that without having to do any of the work to, to do that um, biology yeah. or that chemistry, sorry. And so they, um, it's thought that that's the, re the main reason why they're uh, antibiotic producers and they have so many different natural products is that they're protecting their food source basically because they have to digest it extracellularly. Yeah, no, that's the thing is you, you do all the work and then somebody else eats the sugars that you've just uh, released. So actually, uh, thinking of, of that, this is for, for Damien on, on also in terms of the interactions between the provider and the oxytroph and the heterogeneity that we then have in soil systems. Would you be able to see in terms of associations, again, if, if we can really uh, analyze a soil particle to look at, do we have the provider and the oxytroph actually growing as a microcolony in a soil particle? Or how would that, I mean, again, you, uh, if there, the distance is too far for diffusion, you're not gonna get that benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a fantastic paper from uh, Reynon und Nunun. Uh, I think that came out in a few years ago, 2018 perhaps. Um, and it uh, looks specifically at modeling the spatial separation and what's realistic in like a soil environment. And uh, they were, um, some of their models were predicting that uh, within a sort of 10, 20 micron sort of radius, uh, you really only have like maybe a uh, hundred cells, maybe a thousand cells, but then only probably like um, maybe like I think it was something like t maximum of 10 different sort of like, you know, taxa at the ASV level uh, that could actually sort of like, you know, be present. So, um, yes, I think it is possible that you could have um, actual sort of like, you know, cross uh, feeding of organisms that are growing like, you know, together, probably in a biofilm, of course, because in the environment, that's how these dudes sort of like, you know, coexist. Um, but yes, the spatial separation is so large that um, our idea of looking at sort of like these communities as 6,000 different sort of ASVs and 250 milligrams, that's just like not realistic, I don't think. 
Yeah, and really that the interactions are, are far fewer than what we think based upon our integrated analysis of a whole soil sample. Yep. Okay, no, thank you. I think uh, we are out of time and have to wrap up. So um, Eric, Nathalie, Damien, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining us. Really interesting um, to hear you talk about the work. And again, there were a few questions, uh, some of them technical details that we didn't get to. Uh, so for those, please read the papers. The, you have the links to them and some of, I, I think the answers will be found also there. And uh, again, thank you all who joined us from around the world. Again, it's a wonderful audience. I have several uh, good colleagues in the audience. So, uh, and for others who I don't yet know. So again, thank you for joining us in this webinar and uh, again, Thank you, Eric, Natalie, and Damien. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.